Inside Pediatrics contains real-life surgical scenes in a hospital environment. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Inside Pediatrics. So she wants to go to sleep, was kind of out of it. Okay, I'm gonna put her in trauma too. We just don't know if there's hours or a couple of days. I'm very concerned that Toby could get very sick and need a lot of support. And inside this left ventricle is where you have this mass. I felt like I was here with a ton of bricks. In the middle of America lies one of the busiest independent nonprofit children's hospitals in the country. So go inside the operating rooms and the transports. Go inside each family's journey, each patient's story. Go inside pediatrics at Children's Mercy, Kansas City. Transport this darling. Each year, the transport team brings over 5,000 critically ill children from all around the country to Children's Mercy. I'm a critical care communication specialist and a certified flight communicator. One, two, three. We receive or make 24, 2,500 phone calls a day. It's a, an intricate dance of balancing three modes of transport, seven teams throughout the day. So she wants to go to sleep, was kind of out of it. Right now, pressure is 135 over 64. Heart rate's 83. I know further questions. We'll see you in about 10. Mercy out. Today, the team is picking up a four-year-old girl who may have a potentially life-threatening intestinal obstruction. Doctors in Joplin believe she'll be safer at a pediatric hospital if her condition gets worse. This was my dream job, so here I am. <laughs> I mean, we're the second busiest in the country, and we're trying to keep along to being the best with the top equipment and the top skills. We want to do what's best for our little patients. Comp Center Team 3, we have got John and Ruth, Sal, uh, plus crew. We are in ambulance number 12 in North Kansas City. We are headed to a hospital called Freeman. It's in Joplin, Missouri. So we're going for a four-year-old. She's had some projectile vomiting. They did some lab work that showed that they do have some type of infection going on in the body. Her vital signs are stable now, but anything can change by the time we get there. Hey, guys. Nice to meet you. My name's Jana. So kind of how this works is I'm going to get a team, uh, report from Miranda here, and then Miss Ruth is going to listen to Miss Jennifer and do an assessment. We'll come together and uh, decide what's the best way to transport her and call back to her doctor and go from there. She had a CAT scan mm -hmm. on the abdomen. And that's what, and it showed an obstruction. Okay. Is this your friend? You want him to go on the airplane too? Do you know what Yeah. You can tell Miss Jennifer here doesn't feel very good. She's just kind of laying there and taking it all in. We're giving her some uh, fluid with a little bit of sugar in it so she's not able to eat. The docs are already aware of her and aware of her status, so she already has a room at Children's Mercy. Okay, sweetie, here we go. Thank you. It was very nice to meet you, okay? You take care of yourself. So the heart has two sides to it. There's a right side and a left side. And inside this left ventricle, inside here, is where you have this mass. We don't know what it is. My name is Jim O'Brien, and I am uh, co-director of the Ward Family Heart Center here at Children's Mercy, and also chief of cardiothoracic surgery. So Delijah has a unique problem. He has a very large mass that's sitting in the middle of his left-sided pumping chamber, in the middle of his left ventricle. It takes up nearly the entire cavity. So we'd like to get in through one of these valves here. Okay. If I can't get it completely that way, I can also make a small incision in this upper chamber and work through this valve to okay. get it up. They said I have a tumor in my heart. The crazy thing is I've never known. I've always played sports and all kinds of stuff and never bothered me. So it is not causing him any problems at the moment because the blood is going around this. But right. the concern is that as it grows, it's gonna to start to get in the way and obstruct some of the blood flow. I'm Jonathan Wagner. I'm a pediatric cardiologist. Our role was defining what it is is also where it is too. So we can help our cardiovascular surgeons before they go into the operating room. He's an avid athlete, went in for his yearly exam. The primary care physician heard a murmur and it sounded more of a harsh type quality of a murmur. So he was referred up to our facility for a cardiac MRI and further evaluation. The upshot of all that is, is we need to go in and take it out. 
Children with these complex heart defects really require a multidisciplinary approach. It's not just the surgeons and the cardiologists that care for these kids, but it really is a team. All the parents want to know is that you're doing the best you can at taking care of their kids and that you are the experts in that. And we brought all those experts under this one umbrella in the Ward Family Heart Center. So we go on the heart lung machine, open up the heart, take this out, come off the heart lung machine, and close the incision. Okay. It's scary. I mean, it was just, when we found out, it was just like, I felt like I was hit with a ton of bricks. You know, he just did two full seasons of baseball, weightlifting, football camp, basketball camp. It's so important, even if you don't have kids playing sports, you know, they need to go get a physical, because you never know, because he had his yearly. He could have passed out on the football field this year. Could have killed him instantly, and we would have never known. You know, as a father, you're supposed to be able to, you're here to protect me. I'm trying to stay strong for him, but I just felt helpless. OK. I think you should go in there, Lash. I do. I just think you should go in there. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can just do It's a big surgery. It it's is. open heart surgery. All surgery comes with risks, the chances of them having a major problem. And by that, I mean a heart attack, a stroke, or not surviving the surgery is probably about 1% to 2%. So very small, but unfortunately not zero. We'll take good care of them. I know you will. OK. All right. Thank you. Sure. Fortunately, the specialists at Children's Mercy were able to treat Jenny's abdominal distress with medication. After a few days of treatment following her transport from Joplin, she's able to go home. At this point, she's done great. And so we're hopeful that this will be kind of the end of it. And you guys will get to go home and stay home. And she'll keep feeling better and better. So. I'm just very happy that she's a lot better. But she will be doing follow-ups. I'll make sure of that. So she could be the healthy baby she was. How's the little boy dance, baby? Show him so we can go home. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Tara and Matt Jarvis are at the Fetal Health Center to check on their unborn daughter, Piper. They know she has multiple problems. What they don't know is whether or not she'll be able to survive. I always feel something huge at my belly button and then a ton of stuff in my ribs. So at 26 weeks, we went in for a big echo. All the heart presented is fine, but it was shifted over because they found a diaphragmatic hernia which means her tummy is above her diaphragm and most of her bowel. And they also found a cleft lip and palate. Question is how much lung stuff it's messed up along the way. What? You see Piper? Piper. The prenatal echo was concerning that the aortic arch, the main blood vessel coming off of the heart, was going to be underdeveloped. And that was going to be very problematic in the setting of a diaphragmatic hernia. So we were very pessimistic about her chance for survival. The survival overall for any baby with diaphragmatic hernia is around 70%. If you had a heart defect, it drops to somewhere between 20 and 40%. All done? Almost. Yeah. We've prepared to not bring her home at all. We just don't know if there's hours or a couple of days that, that that's still very unknown, but I think it will be known pretty darn immediately as soon as my job's done. The Elizabeth J. Farrell Fetal Health Center provides specialized care for unborn babies with a wide range of developmental defects. The morbidity and mort mortality associated with developmental problems like this are extremely high. And so the idea behind the center is that if we can optimize the care of these babies, that in fact we will improve not only their immediate outcomes, but their long-term health. The traditional process of transferring a baby from one hospital to another separates the family. And we think that there's a variety of advantages to having mom uh, in the same hospital at the time when the baby may be very critical and is requiring significant medical attention. The second part of it then is to have the family come in and talk with a multidisciplinary group that we can pull together so that really we can give the family an idea about what the problems are and then what we can do about it. Ready? Joanna, come on back. Chad Riggenborn and Joanna Crossfield's unborn son, Tobin, also has a hole in his diaphragm, and his lungs are not developing properly. 
doctors are trying to determine the severity of his condition. We went to our original sonogram appointment when he came in and said that he has a diaphragmatic hernia. We're sending you down to Children's Mercy. And he said all his stuff's up in his chest, lungs squished, hearts pushed over. No matter how good he does, he's going to have to have surgery. They're going to have to cut him open and patch up his diaphragm, pull his stuff back down. Yeah, I think he'll work with you today. Hopefully. Yeah. Well, that Jesus? Right. <laughs> nobody wants to go through this, you know, and nobody wants to see a child have to go through this. But talking with the team here, the surgeon and the NICU doctor and all that, and this is the only hospital in the region that deals with what he has, the diaphragmatic hernia. You see that? Definitely. Yeah, that one. Yeah, see? Yeah, right there. That's your brother. This is the fourth one. We got one girl, and this will be three boys, so got half a baseball team going on. Nobody wants to hear that your child only has an 80% chance of making it. We're just hoping for the best, and we'll be here a lot until he's ready to go home. Surgery day is an emotional roller coaster from Elijah and his family. Hi, how are you? Doing okay? Yeah? Are you a little nervous? My name is Sandy Filson, and I am a nurse in the CVOR. But no pokes, nothing sharp, nothing's gonna hurt, okay? Mark my word. He was super nervous, but he was such a trooper. And his parents were just right there for that kiddo, and it was amazing. Finally, we were able to get him calmed down just a little bit. pretty rare. Tumors of the heart overall are pretty rare. Usually something that's in the upper chambers of the heart, something that's in the collecting chambers. It's unusual to have it in this position. The whole team is involved in trying to come up with a plan. We're going to go in initially through an aortotomy, and hopefully we'll be able to get it out that way. All right, maybe? Yep, go ahead. All right, you're open. So this is the pericardium. This is the sac that the heart sits in. So we're going to open that up here, and that'll bring us right down to the heart. So he's completely on bypass, with the heart still beating. So what we're going to do now is we're going to interrupt the blood flow to the coronary arteries, which are the arteries that supply the blood to the heart itself, and put a cold solution down there. It's going to stop the heart and preserve it. But even though the heart's beating, all the blood is going around it now, so no blood's going to the heart and to the lungs. And you'll see the EKG up there go flat in just a second. valve, and if you see this bluish colored tissue there, that's all the mass. It's taking up most of the cavity. I'm trying to find where it's connected, and it's deep within the heart here, but I need to cut out what it's connected to, but not cut out anything that's vital. They say about down to the mass part, so that's what we're worried right there. My son, he looked at us, and he told us, he said, God's got it. With tears rolling down his eyes. Yeah. So how can you doubt that, you know? This is really all into the wall here, multiple spots. I'm just trying to get every last bit out. If it's kind of stuck to multiple things, it just makes you worry a little bit more about how aggressive it is. But what they see on a histology under the microscope is going to tell the story. This one was pretty gelatinous. When you grabbed it, it was coming apart. It took up most of the left ventricular cavity, so we had to cut along a, a lot of the wall to get it out. After we get the aorta closed here, we'll be able to let the heart start beating again. 
SVC tape is off. Back up, cross clamps off. So the heart should start on itself. Sometimes it comes back in a little bit of a disorganized rhythm. Pedals. The team waits to see if Nalija's heart will beat on its own after the mass is removed. This is his own rhythm. Heart function looks good. We just got to get him warmer. While Nalija recovers from surgery, pathologists will determine if the mass is cancerous. Ready, Freddie? Good. At this appointment, doctors will conduct an echocardiogram to examine the extent of Baby Piper's heart defect. I had already crashed and burned, like, in the middle of all of this and gotten over my feel sorry for myself thing and was kind of worried about Matt in the middle because he got really quiet. And I think after a couple of the integrated consults where they had really told us things were bad, his pain was delayed with the, holy crap, this might not work out. And I told him, if we were to lose her, what we've had doesn't change, and we should appreciate that. These fetal malformations that we're identifying can be extremely complicated. After receiving Piper's scans, the team begins to analyze them. But Piper's organs are in the wrong place, so the images are extremely hard to interpret. Hopefully, here's where we start to get some clarity. There obviously is a significant congenital anomaly with the heart. Because the concern last time was the arch. hypoplastic arch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That looks better. It's still too difficult to. No, I think it looks better. This is somewhere, but it could be here, and it could be here, and it could be here, and I don't have any idea. The hardest thing is probably delivering the bad news that there is a problem and that their lives are going to be dramatically altered the rest of their lives. They want a normal child, and they don't have a normal child. That's the worst. I think that's why we sit here staring at these pictures, because we want to be certain. I want to know. I want to be able to tell them exactly what the problem is. Today, the medical experts on the fetal health team come together to have a serious talk with Chad and Joanna about Tobin's chances. Hello again. <laughs> so Dr. Kickinshaw is going to show you those pictures from your MRI, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what will happen when Tobin's born. Consults are always tough, um, especially here in the Field Health Center, because it's not usually going to be something that's uh, easy, and we don't get to deliver a lot of good news. Over on the left is where you know he's got the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Because of all of this extra stuff up in his chest, all of his mediastinum and his heart are pushed over to the other side. So they're all kind of pushed to the right. And here's where she's got measurements to figure out how much lung he actually has and how much we would expect him to have at this age. He's coming up about 23% of what we expect. Okay. Diaphragmatic hernias are especially tough because they are um, one of our highest mortalities. The baby might come out and surprise us all, or the baby, Toby, might come out and be as sick as we expect. And so the 23% is concerned. And so the question is whether or not that 23% of the lung is going to be enough lung for Tobin to be able to survive. Once we put everything down and back into the abdomen, it doesn't immediately reverse the problem that the lungs are underdeveloped. That takes a lot of time. Nothing is 100%, but we're very concerned that Tobin could get very sick and need a lot of support and a lot of help early on. Know all of his numbers and, and everything. What percentage you give making it? Probably somewhere between 50 and 70%. Even with all of these numbers and as much as we look at them, it's still not 100%. And that's why we really won't know for sure how Tobin's going to do until Tobin's here and, and gives us a, a day or so to see how he's adjusting to not being on the placenta and how that 23% of lung that he has is working. Now that she's 35 weeks, she's close. Reality is beginning to set in because in less than a month, he's going to be here, and we're going to know how sick he's going to be. Chad, what do you think? I don't mean that real old, my son. <laughs> Whatever we got to do, if I can't hold him for the first three months of his life, as long as I get to take him home with me, I don't care. 
I'll sacrifice anything I can to take him with me. We can give you a few minutes if that'd be helpful. trying to do my best to stay strong for the whole family, but it's hard to do. Once you start thinking about not being able to take your kid home, it's just not right. Pathology results came back today, and the family is relieved to learn that Elijah's mass was not cancerous. He can go home without further treatment. We're getting ready to send Elijah home today, so he's ready to be discharged and go home. Are you excited? Uh, it's been four days since he, since, he, since he had surgery. You know, considering what kind of surgery he had, man, he's doing great. Do you have any other questions for us? No? No other questions? <laughs> OK. Last 48 hours or so was really hard for him. We had a visitor today that made things so, so much better that really just brightened up his whole day. Alex Gordon came and visited me. He took it off his back and gave it to me. It's the first time I smiled since surgery. A smile. <laughs> All right, Good. perfect. Thank All right, kiddo, you. you take care, OK? You can go show him what's up on the basketball court That's once it. you're feeling better. <laughs> There's that smile. To see the smile on my son's face and seeing him able to get around now, I'm just overjoyed. <laughs> uh, awesome. Thank, Thank you, Tina, for everything. Night. We're ready to get him recuperated and just doing normal kid things like he always has. So it's looking very positive. I'm coming home. On the next episode of Inside Pediatrics, we're going to lose her. Is it going to be quick? We need to completely reconstruct the aortic arch. It's a dramatic difference. We're on a half flow. This function could be a little bit better. I don't think I've ever been this scared of anything in my life.